how can we represent God to the watching world? How can we be God's people so that the world can know God and be saved? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? I'd say it's a pretty key question. And Isaiah 6 gives us an answer. In it, we see how Isaiah was commissioned by God for his role as God's spokesman. And so Isaiah models how we're commissioned to be his people too. And we're going to notice four things, but before we get into it, let's just pause and pray. Heavenly Father, please help us to listen carefully to your word. Please help us not to think that we can sit over it and judge it, but please help us to sit under it so that it might judge and correct and change us. And please would you work by your spirit to bring this alive to us now as I speak. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want us to notice four things in the passage. And the first is that we need to see God in all his glory. We need to see God in all his glory. This is where it starts. In verses 1 to 4, Isaiah sees God. And it's too much. He can barely look. He begins telling us that it's in the year of King Uzziah's death. Now that is at the end of a great reign. 52 years Uzziah reigned and it was a reign of glory, of military success, of prosperity and security, and even of true religion. So he's saying in a time when suddenly all the old certainties are shaken, that the king is gone, the government is gone. In that year, Isaiah had a vision. And it's a vision of another king in the Holy of Holies. Not an upstart human king, but the true king, the one king who's worthy to stand in that place. As Isaiah goes on to say in verse 5, my eyes have seen the king, the Lord Almighty. So what did you see? Well, let's have a look at verses 1 to 4. Let me read it for you. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Did you see? He saw the Lord. And he saw him in all his pomp and his glory in his throne room, sitting on the heavenly throne, high and exalted over all things, as we'd expect for the king of heaven itself. And you get the sense that Isaiah saw, but he couldn't look. You know, it's like looking at the sun, it's just too bright. He saw the Lord on his throne, but that's about all we can say about that. It sounds like he's looked away pretty quickly because next thing we read, he's looking down, looking at the Lord's robe, so magnificent that its hem fills the whole temple. And then he looks up and he sees there these angels, seraphs, which means fire ones, uh, presumably because the angels shine like fire, as the New Testament often describes them. This probably explains why the first thing an angel usually said is, do not be afraid, because they're terrifying. And the thing is, as powerful, as impressive as these angels are, in God's presence, they can't look either. They've actually got, as I described, extra sets of wings to, to cover themselves in God's presence. One extra to cover their eyes and one extra to cover their feet. And I read six commentaries on this and none of them explains why their feet are covered. But I guess it's a bit like when Moses met God at the burning bush and God said to him, take off your sandals because you're standing on holy ground. So in the presence of God, they show this respect to even cover their feet. So it seems that even the angels are all but overwhelmed in God's presence. See, they can't stop praising God as they wait on him, calling out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And as Isaiah listens, their voices alone are enough to shake the temple. And as they call, the place is filled with smoke. See, these are formidable creatures. Their voices terrify the prophet. They remind him of God's appearances on Mount Sinai, when God's people feared they might die at the sound of God's voice. Have you got a picture? These mighty beings, glowing like fire, so majestic we would fall down and worship them if we met one. And here they are in massed ranks, but they're just a sideshow. They themselves are starstruck. They're united at their wonder at the glory and majesty of God. See, they're a bit like us before the Queen. I can't help thinking of uh, Meghan and Harry's Oprah, Oprah interview. Um, do you remember it? There was a moment when Meghan described her first meeting with Her Majesty. She said he and, she and Harry were out going to visit family, and when they arrived, the Duchess of York rushes out to make sure that Meghan can curtsy properly, because the Queen is there. And Meghan says, as she turns to Harry, and she says, but she's your granny. 
And Harry says, yeah, the Queen. <laughs> See, even in private family moments, the Queen can't turn off being the Queen. She still requires due deference. Or for another example, during Prince Philip's funeral, there was a whole section when his royal titles were announced. And it's quite a list. So let me read a section for you. I've got something written here. It says that he is the most illustrious and most exalted Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, Earl of Merioneth, and Baron Greenwich, Knight of the Most whole Noble Order of the Garter, Knight of the Most Ancient and Most Noble Order of the Thistle, Member of the Order of Merit, Knight Grand Cross of the Royal Victorian Order. And on and on and on it went. There's dozens of these royal titles. Now, Prince Philip enjoyed a distinguished naval career before his marriage, uh, but these titles didn't relate to his military service. They were the titles he required to sit with his bride, to walk behind her in her royal duties. She is so exalted that to be married to her required him to be elevated to exalted ranks also. See, we're to understand that the Queen is to be on it. She's the Queen. But compared to God, we're talking about children playing mud cakes in the mud, aren't we? See, Isaiah sees God and he realises God is so far exalted above us in glory and majesty that, that there is no comparison at all, not even with the highest, most exalted king. And in all of this, did you notice, the focus falls especially on one aspect of God's glory, his holiness. Now, you probably know that repetition was the way that the Hebrew language expressed perfection. And to say that gold was especially pure, you'd say it was gold gold. To say that a field was full of pits, you'd say it was all pits pits. You know, both of those are biblical examples from 2 Kings 25 and from Genesis 14. And um, I sort of get that. I'm from Wagga Wagga. You know, it's so woggery, it's the essence of Wagga. Okay, maybe that illustration doesn't really work. But that's how it was in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew language. But did you know? In the whole Old Testament, there's not a single other example of a threefold repetition like we have here. There is no gold, gold, gold. But here, to express God's holiness, the angels have to break the language. He's not just holy. He's not just the holiest of holies. He is holiness raised to the power of holy, multiplied by holy. <laughs> We might say he's not just 100% holy, not even 110% holy. He is 1,000 million percent holy. You know, language can't express how holy he is. We have no words, we might say. He is that holy. Which is to say, he, has, he is as completely removed from us as it is possible to be. He is as unlike us as uncreated life is from every created thing as perfection is from everything flawed, as infinite is from everything that can be counted, as eternal is from everything that has a beginning and an end. And in particular, this difference, this separation, has to do with his moral purity. See, when we've once looked at him, when we've seen him as he is, nothing else seems pure again. In fact, we never know what holiness is, what goodness is, until we've looked at him. And then we can never call anything else less good ever again. See, seeing God truly, Isaiah begins to get a sense of who he is truly. And so this is point two. We need to realise our own disgrace. We need to see God as he is in his holy glory, and we need to realise our own disgrace. See, verse 5, Isaiah's response is essentially, Oh my goodness, I am in so much trouble. Only uh, being an Old Testament prophet, the way he says this, Woe to me! I am ruined! I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Have you ever found yourself radically wrongly dressed? You know, have you turned up to a formal, drew, formal do with your, with your tracky bones and your, and your flip-flops? Or worse, have you gone fancy dressed only to find you're the only one? When I was in primary school, we had a uniform free day at school. I can't remember why. I think it was just my year. And I remember mum dressing me up in my best outfit, probably my favourite BMX t-shirt and my black stubby shorts. Oh, I love that outfit. And I, when I put them on, I used to feel so proud, so well-dressed. And, and so mum dressed me up in my favourite outfit and then she sent me off to school. 
and we used to walk to school on our own, so there were, there were no grown-ups with us as we got there. But the thing was, Mum had got the day wrong. I was a week early. In the whole school, as far as I can remember, I was the only kid not in school uniform. You know, 200 kids all dressed the same, and me. <laughs> and I remember the shame. I can still feel the burn of it. I remember huddling on the bench outside my classroom at break, so self-conscious, just wishing the ground would swallow me up. Do you know that feeling? So humiliating. Well, just turn that up a few thousand times. You know, if you're embarrassed to be wrongly dressed before, before, before a few of your friends or, or colleagues or, or kids from school, how much worse would it be? How much more would you be humiliated to be wrongly dressed in the presence of the King of Kings? And, you know, there's actually a moral element to wearing the wrong clothes, is there? It's not wrong, not, you know, morally wrong. I didn't deserve punishment. I didn't deserve death or anything for being out of uniform. But as Isaiah sees God, he realises he's wrongly dressed, morally He's turned up to the highest society in heaven and earth, and not only is he naked, he is shamefully covered in uncleanness. Now think about this. Isaiah was God's prophet. He spoke for God. By this point, he's already spent five chapters telling everyone else how sinful they are. Now suddenly he realises which side of the line he's on. He's not on God's side, holy, blameless, so he can denounce everyone else. No, he's on the other side of that line. He is unholy. He is blameworthy. He is disgraced. And we'll never get the gospel unless we get this. We are unworthy, deeply, profoundly, horribly unworthy. That's what Isaiah realised when he saw God as he really is. He realised what he was really like, how desperate he really was. And this is when he experiences the wonder of the grace he's been preaching. So thirdly, we need to receive God's grace. We need to receive God's grace. So here in verses 6 and 7 is a beautiful picture of Jesus' work for us. Remember Isaiah was in the temple, you know, he sees God and his throne, his, his, the hem of his robe fills the temple. And of course, there in the temple, the priest made sacrifices for sins. You know, and in the Holy of Holies, there was the altar of incense, where, where the priest had to burn incense to conceal the atonement cover so that he wouldn't die, because no one could even look on God's dwelling place without guilt. And so this altar, as it were, sums up the whole sacrificial system, and therefore it sums up all that Jesus does for us in giving himself in our place. So his sacrifice covers over our sin. And it removes our guilt from us. That is, it makes atonement. It makes us at one with God. Just as if we'd never sinned, or, or better still, as if we had lived Jesus' perfect life. And so as, as Isaiah looks on, the angel takes a call from the altar. And he comes to Isaiah. <laughs> and Isaiah might well have been thinking, well, this is it. You know, woe is me. I'm now going to be burned up by God's moral purity, just as I deserve. But it isn't the end at all. Instead, at the touch of the coal, he is cleansed. Cleansed, made clean. The, the atonement, one on the altar, is, is given to him. His guilt is taken away, like, like that scapegoat led out away from the camp, off into the wilderness, never to be seen again. His sin is removed far from his presence. And he is washed clean, just as if he'd never sinned. As if he's lived Jesus' blameless life. As if he is clothed in Jesus' perfection. This is Isaiah 118, isn't it? Though his sins are as red as scarlet, they're made as white as snow. Though they're as red as crimson, they're made like pure white wool. See, Isaiah has preached it. Now Isaiah lives it. Now he knows what it means from the inside. Isaiah experiences the wonder of forgiveness. And he experiences it as a wonder, as a joy, as a glorious rescue. And so must we. In God's economy, there is no cheap grace. Grace is costly. Jesus gives himself on the altar for us. So grace humbles, humiliates us, even as it lifts us up. And only now is Isaiah ready to serve God, ready to speak for God. So fourth thing we need to notice, 
knowing God's grace, then we can speak for God. So in verse 8, God calls out, Whom shall I send? Who will go for me? And gloriously, Isaiah at this point finds his voice and he says, Send me! Send me! And immediately he is sent. Uh, but it's not what we're expecting, is it? Look what God commissions him for in verse 9. God says to him, Go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. What a job. Isaiah is appalled. For how long, Lord, he asks. And God's answer is equally appalling. Look at verse 11. God answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everything, everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Ouch! I mean, really, ouch! Isaiah's job is to speak words of life to a people who will ignore and reject them until they become to them words of death. God will speak through Isaiah's newly cleansed lips, but no one will receive what he says until their hearts are so hard from rejecting God's word that God's word will bring judgment on them all. Cities ruined, houses deserted, land utterly forsaken. This might be the worst job description of all time, mightn't it? Who wants this job? But this is the pattern, isn't it? God's prophets speak and the world says, shut up. No, really, shut up. Stop saying that. And you know it. Ultimately, these words are about Jesus, aren't they? Five times Jesus quotes these words to explain his ministry. His disciples say, why do you speak to the people in parables? And he says, I'll tell you why. So they'll be ever hearing, but never understanding. Ever seeing, but never perceiving. Huh? What's the point of all that then? The point is, God is showing sin to be utterly sinful. Showing sin to be utterly sin sinful. And showing us sinners that we're utterly sinful. And he has to show us that, because like Isaiah, we're in the habit of thinking, well, we're not so bad. You know, it's, it's everyone else who's got a problem. You know, when we search out the dark basements of our own hearts, we do so with, with a little five-watt torch that we bought at the end of the junk aisle at Aldi one night when we're out picking up the shopping. You know, we don't try very hard, because we don't really want to see what's down there. But God comes along, not with one of those little five-watt torches, one of those great big searchlights that they use to light up the Hollywood sky. You know, the ones you can see them for miles around. Not five watts, 600,000 watts. And God sticks that great big thing right up in the doorway. And he says, take a proper look. It's a disgrace down there. How bad is it? When Jesus came to live this commission in all its fullness... His ministry so exposed people's hearts, so infuriated them, that they literally put him to death. That's what we're like. We're going to pretend our rebellion against God is, is you know, it's a good-natured affair. Oh, I don't mind him. I'm just doing my own thing. I can get on with doing what I'm doing. He can just get on with his thing. And, you know, I, I don't mind God at all. I'm just doing my own thing. And I don't know why he'd care about little old me. Or, or I'm not bothering anyone and, you know, he shouldn't bother me either. But it's not like that. Not really. When we're exposed with that searing searchlight of God's holy, 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 holiness, it is so offensive to our sinful minds that we would do anything to shut him up. We'd kill him if we could. That's what's lurking down there in the basements of our hearts. Murder, war, hatred. Of course we don't want anyone poking around down there. We're like a grubby politician trying to hide the source of the funds, trying to pretend it doesn't matter what we say as long as we keep the economy running, as long as we keep the vaccines coming. But if we're going to reach anyone for Christ, if we're going to be his people representing him to the world, this is what we need to see and to teach others. God is holy, utterly holy. 
Morality is his bag, it's his thing. He cares intensely about our moral lives. He utterly rejects everything that's bad. And this is his glory. This is what makes him so magnificent, so highly exalted, so worthy of all praise and honour from all those angels for all eternity. And in the light of his searing perfection, we are exposed in all our imperfection. And he exposes us because he wants us to come to him for cleansing, for healing, for grace. It's what we need more than anything. And the thing is, we'll never tell that story properly while ever we imagine that we don't need it. While ever we think that we're on God's side of the line between good and evil. While ever we think we can look down on everyone else in sneering judgment. God grants Isaiah this vision so Isaiah can radically recalibrate his own perception of himself in the light of who God is. And only then can Isaiah preach truly to a people who, who won't accept the truth. And if he does that, well, then some of them will be won over, like the stump that has life in it and will one day produce no new growth. So, when God chooses to act, he will call some to life through this message, even as most reject it. And in the same way, we need a radical recalibration of who we are in the light of who God is. So we can leave this same message in the presence of people who will refuse to hear it from us. And we must go on speaking this message of life because God will use it to save some, even though it will mean many will reject us. So do you want to speak for God? Do you want to live for God in the face of the world? It won't be easy. Do you want to live as his people in a hostile world? It won't be comfortable. But it is the only hope we have. It's the only hope the world has. And if you want to be on God's team, you need to see God's glory, his magnificent, holy, holy, holy glory. And you need to see your own disgrace, your utter moral bankruptcy. You need to receive God's grace for yourself and to proclaim the wonder, to live the wonder, the joy of forgiveness. And you need to keep going, even when that message is rejected and mocked and scorned, even when it gets you into trouble. And then God can use you to save some. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please give us, as you gave to Isaiah, a true vision of your might, your glory, your power, your holiness. In the light of all that you are, help us to see ourselves truly, to know the shame, the disgrace of our unholiness holiness, so that we would receive your grace as a mighty gift, a wonderful salvation, a rescue. And Lord, please help us not just to know that story, not just to tell it, but to live it, to live the joy, the wonder of grace so that others might hear it. And Lord, we read in your word that when we speak, when we live that story, people might reject us, people might hate us and despise us. But there is hope that you will use it to bring some to salvation. So please would you do that. Help us to hold on to it, to keep living it, whatever comes. And please would you use it to bring some to salvation. And so may you be glorified in us. May your holy glory be seen in us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.